guys, welcome back. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about some of the biomechanics of our spine. So in our last video we referenced, you know, three of the main pillars of biomechanics being structure, function, and motion. So in this video we're gonna be going over the structure of our spine, right? So a lot of the anatomy that, um, you know, comprises our spine. So the basic thing to go over first of the spine is the regions of the spine. So we have five regions of our spine. We have the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, and then the sacrum and the coccyx, right? So the cervical spine is what we think of really as like the neck, right? So it's the upper seven vertebrae of your spine, all right? And then your uh, thoracic spine is comprised of 12 vertebrae. That's like your mid-back, what most people, you know, would think of as mid-back. And then the lumbar spine is your lower back, okay? The sacrum and the coccyx are kind of paired together. Um, you know, that's basically below, like by your butt and the, that's gonna articulate with your pelvis. So, um, you know, those are the regions of the spine. And then each region of the spine has its own specific curvature. So for in the cervical region, we're gonna have a lordotic curve, right? And so I'll explain kind of what these terms mean. Um, but then in the thoracic spine, we're gonna have a kyphotic curve to the spine. And then in the lumbar spine, we're gonna have another lordotic curve, okay? And these curves kind of develop over time. So as you're forming in the womb, because you're crunched up in that fetal position, your kyphotic uh, curvature in your thoracic spine is the first curvature of your spine to form. And then once you're born as a baby, you start lifting your head up. And that's when you start to develop the lordotic curve in your cervical spine. And then once you start standing up and walking, that now your lumbar spine has to start supporting weight and that's where your lordotic curve of your lumbar spine starts to develop, okay? And so the, um, these, these curves in your spine actually serve a purpose and it's because with the curvature of each region, it actually allows the spine to be more flexible but also supported and to um, you know, support different movements and different loads placed on the spine at those different locations. So when we're talking about curvature of the spine, it's important to understand what lordosis and what kyphosis really are, okay? So looking at this little diagram I drew here, um, you know, a kyphotic curve, which is a primary curve because it's the ones that form first, are gonna be in the thoracic region and the sacral region, right? And that's kind of that humping that we see, right? So if you see like an old lady who's kind of hunched over like that, that's a kyphotic curve that you're seeing. Right? And our secondary curves, because they form second, are in the cervical and the lumbar spine. And that's more of that arching, right? So lordosis, arching, kyphosis, humping, okay? So when you look at the spine, it's really comprised of two components. You're gonna have the vertebra and the discs, okay? And a majority of the vertebra in our spines are gonna have share, be sharing common characteristics. So I'm gonna go over those really fast. So they all are gonna have a body, right? And that's like the big meaty part of the vertebra, the thick part. That's what gives our spine kind of the height that we, that we see, all right? Then it's all, so behind the body is gonna be the posterior arch of the vertebra, okay? The, the posterior arch is comprised of a pedicle, a, a lamina, and a spinous process. Okay, and so the pedicle is this little region right here. The lamina is this region right here. And then the spinous process is this region right here. And all co connected, they create a little arch because this little hole that they make is gonna be where your spinal cord and some blood vessels run through, okay? But so, body, pedicle, lamina, spinous process, and then the transverse process, which is these little prongs sticking out to the side. And the spinous process and the transverse processes are going to be the attachment sites for a lot of muscles that surround the spinal column, okay? So those are kind of important spots, especially when we're talking about biomechanics, because the point of these attachments is gonna depend on, you know, it's gonna determine how that spinal uh, segment moves when, you know, those muscles are contracting, okay? The other component that I just mentioned is the discs, right? And so the discs are the little um, kind of jelly things that separate each vertebra, right? And they rest on top of each other. These are really important for shock absorption, which we'll get into in the next video when we're talking about a lot of the functions of the spine, okay? But the disc itself is compro comprised of two different materials. Um, the outer layers of the disc 
which are going to be a more fibrotic material, are going to be, um, that's called the annulus fibrosis. And what that does is it's a kind of a tougher material that is really going to be taking on a lot of the tension in the spine. The innermost part of the disc is this little circle in here, and that's kind of more of a jelly, right? And so that's a little bit of a softer material, but that's going to be really important because it allows the spine to absorb shock, right? And that jelly can deform, right? Again, we'll talk about some more of this when we're talking about the function of the spine. But so the disc comprised of the annulus fibrosis and the nucleus, which is the center part, the nucleus propulsus. Okay? So let's take a closer look at the cervical spine now. As we mentioned, most of the vertebrae in your spine are very similar, but there are a couple that are more unique. So that's what we're going to kind of spend a little more time on here. The first one is C1. Okay? C1 is unique because it itself does not have a body, as we mentioned on the board behind us. So it's more of just a big arch, right? And that's because it needs to articulate with the one below it, which is C2, which is also a unique vertebra. And what it is, is there's a process or a peg that pops up from that one that the front arch of C1 articulates with, and that's going to allow for rotation of the cervical spine. And actually, most of the rotation of the cervical spine is going to happen at the C1, C2 joint. Okay? The top of the C1 is basically just two masses that are going to allow for the base of the skull to rest on. Okay? So there's no true body of C1. It's just more of an arch. C2, like we mentioned, has the peg or the odontoid process, and that is going to be held in place by a couple ligaments that, as we mentioned, allows for the rotation of C1. Okay? The bottom of C2 is a body, and that's going to articulate with C3 and C3 with C4 and so on all the way down until we get down to C7, which does have a body, but what makes C7 pretty special is that it has such a large spinous process. And that's significant because that's where a lot of the musculature in your neck and upper back is going to be attaching to. So you can actually feel it on the back of your neck. If you feel it back here, that's your C7 spinous process. And it, it's pretty prominent. Okay? So as far as osteology goes, that's what's significant about the cervical spine. Now let's take a look here. As you can see, you have a lot of these little yellow things, which are nerves coming out of the spine. What happens is that between each vertebra, there's a little um, little ridge that's carved out, and when they are pressed together, it creates a circle or a foramen, and that's where these spinal nerves are going to be coming out of the spinal cord and exiting the spinal column in that foramen. You can also see that you have a blood vessel running up the cervical spine here, and that's your vertebral artery. Okay, so just like we said, there's a foramen formed by the two vertebra meeting. Each vertebra also has a foramen sticking out on its transverse process that allows for the vertebral artery to run all the way up until it gets to C1, where it's going to connect on both sides and then go up to the brainstem. Moving on to the thoracic spine, um, there's nothing too exciting about the thoracic spine. Uh, all the layouts of the vertebra are very similar to the one on the board here that we showed you of the basic, uh, you know, standard vertebra. One thing to note is going to be that as the bodies uh, move inferiorly, they are larger because obviously they're taking on a larger amount of force, you know, transmitted down through the spine. So they got to have a little more substance to them. Um, the most important thing about the thoracic spine is the rib articulations. So we're going to kind of talk about those right now. So as you can see here, what we're going to have is an articulation of the rib is going to touch both vertebra and it's going to be right at like the junction. Okay. So the top part of the rib head is going to be resting right about there. And the bottom part of the rib head is going to be resting there. And as you can see, they, they move kind of out like that. And so the way it's going to rest here is against those two vertebra and then also against the transverse process here. There's a costal facet for the rib to rest against. And it's really going to sit in that groove just like that, right? And they'll, as they go down, all like that. And they flare out and come around to the front, okay? So that's important for ribs, especially when we're talking about breathing and um, just general thorax function. Uh, rib articulations are going to be one of the things that we touch on. So moving on to the lumbar spine now, um, as we can see, the lumbar spine, the bodies uh, are the largest of any of the vertebrae on the spine, and that's because 
as you get lower into the spine, it's going to be a lot more load being distributed onto this portion of the spine. And so you're going to need thicker bodies to withstand that load. Okay. So as we can see here on the back, these still have the processes like we mentioned before. Uh, it's worth noting that in the lumbar spine, because of all the stabilization that needs to take place, there's a few more little bony processes that are kind of hard to see on this model, but that's where a lot of the supporting musculature is going to be attaching there. So we do have, you know, a lot of stabilizing musculature attaching to the processes in the bottom of the spine. Um, these are the discs that we were kind of talking about. So this outer part that we can see here, as we mentioned before, that's going to be the annulus fibrosis. So that's that more, you know, fibrous, uh, connective tissue that is helping check tension in the spine. You can't really see the nucleus propulsus. That would be on the inner part portion of the disc. Uh, and then around the side here, you can see, so this is the nerves exiting through the intervertebral uh, foramen. And um, it, this is especially important in the lumbar spine because in the lumbar spine, uh, that's the most common area for disc herniations and bulges due to uh, the amount of load placed at this region and when flexing can really push the disc material back and eventually cause it to break through uh, through the ligaments holding in place. And when that does happen, this is where we get pressure on these nerve roots exiting through here. And that's where conditions like sciatica, um, you know, start to manifest. It's because of the pressure on the nerve roots as they exit through these foramen, um, you know, causing symptoms that you're now feeling in your spinal cord. And as we move down, uh, we'll, we'll also just kind of go right into the sacrum. Uh, the sacrum, as you can see, is this kind of like big plated uh, triangular structure. And it's kind of ironic because the base of the sacrum is actually at the top and the apex is at the bottom. That's because it's, you know, where it comes to a point. Um, and we still have nerve roots running down into the sacrum. The ala, or the kind of winged structures of the sacrum, that's going to be the portions that articulate with your pelvis, creating the sacroiliac joint, which uh, we'll discuss in future videos. And then moving down here is your coccyx. And there's really not much to mention about the coccyx. It's kind of a useless piece of anatomy that is kind of more of a uh, remnant in our bodies now. So that about sums up our discussion on the structure of the spine. Uh, I know it's a lot of anatomy and terms and can be a little dry, but it's pretty imperative that we go over this stuff because you'll see as we move forward, now we can start to discuss the function and the motion of the spine. And the structure of the spine is really what gives rise to all of that. So understanding that is gonna allow us to understand how the spine moves and really the way it works, uh, especially under loads and stress and exercise and stuff, okay? so. Uh, if you guys like the video, go ahead and give us a like, uh, you know, please subscribe. We got a lot more good content coming and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.